Are you tired of the ignorance of the unwashed masses? One way we can address this is by rising above the heaviness of the lower energies that others around us might be bringing. And today, this video will help you do that. Who knows, by the end of this presentation, your whole understanding of reality might be transformed. This year, I've spent a lot of time reading scriptures, all kinds, you know, and I'm excited to make videos about all of them, from the Bhagavad Gita to the Upanishads, the Tao Te Ching and the Emerald Tablets, and I'd be making my way through the Bible and the Quran, among others. Now, the concepts that we're looking at today come from ancient India, which are the three states of reality called the Gunas, and the bigger concept that they're a part of, Prakriti and Purusha. So let's break it down. First, we have Prakriti. This is considered the field of reality itself. All of the energy, the atoms and molecules, the particles and waves, the physical senses and our sense experiences that we have, our bodies, our homes, and the entire universe, really everything is considered Prakriti. It is the illusion of reality. Then you have Purusha, which is the capital S self. You might call it God or spirit, but it's more commonly described as the cosmic being or consciousness, pure awareness, or simply the universal principle underlying all things. So the idea is that Prakriti is always changing and moving. Change is a universal constant, and thus Prakriti, the reality, cannot help but change and move, just as we do. But Purusha is the unmoving, everlasting cosmic principle of consciousness underlying all things. It doesn't move, and is perfect and everlasting. When you have those moments of divine revelation, or reach a transcendent psychedelic state where you seem to touch eternity, that is you deepening your connection beyond Prakriti and into Purusha. Now within the field of reality, there are three states that Prakriti may take, which are called the gunas. These are called sattva, rajas, and tamas. They apply both to the whole of reality, as well as relate to our personal experience of life in a very direct way. First, we have tamas, which is known as stability. But more commonly, it speaks to the heavy states of ignorance, at least as far as human consciousness is concerned. Tamas is typified as laziness, impurity, and darkness. It is the consequence of ignorance, and it prevents people from perceiving the truth and really understanding the nature of reality. Tamas may also be translated as matter, and so it's very relevant to the physical body, and the more tamasic energy you have, the heavier you will feel. When you're especially depressed or feeling weighed down, it's because there's a lot of tamas present within you. Second, we have rajas, known as a state of action or activity. This is at a higher rate of vibration than tamas, typified within people through passion, a longing for satisfaction and fulfillment of desires. This is the great challenge of rajas, that it is often compelled by greed, and this is where many people get stuck. When they feel they have to work and work and work so that they can get ahead in life and make more money, there's a bit of a rajasic trap at work. Nevertheless, this is also a very creative place, and it's through rajas that physical results come into being. Finally, we have our third and our highest state, called sattva. Sattva represents pure consciousness, radiant presence, truth, and compassion. The quality of sattva is that of a clear mind, calmness, and receptivity. It is a state of being one draws themselves into when meditating and cultivating inner peace, and it is the closest of the three gunas to Purusha, the cosmic principle underlying all things. This is why in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna explains that the way to reach the divine is through sattva, through the meditative state. Further, it is through sattva that the other two gunas are elevated and entirely transformed. Now that we have an understanding of the essential concept, we can take things a bit further. Going full circle to the start of this very video, you can see that when ignorance is taking over, it's really an overabundance or saturation in tamas, or possibly rajas, maybe a mix of the two. If you know someone who spends a lot of time in front of the TV, or smoking way too much weed, or has a bunch of beers every night and is growing a bit of a belly, then that's a sign of maybe just a bit too much tamas. On the other hand, if someone you know works way too hard at the expense of taking care of themselves 
or perceiving a greater truth, you can identify that with an excess of rajas. In all cases, tamas and rajas can be elevated through sattva, which can look like taking the action of calming down, meditating, doing some yoga, journaling, going to a spa, doing some mindfulness practices, or just listening to gentle music. One other way that we can identify the gunas in our lives is through our food. We are what we eat after all, and since the gunas relate with all of reality, then it's no surprise that our food too is a pretty big part of that. If you can identify if your food is tamasic, rajasic, or sattvic, then you can have a clear picture of how well nourished and balanced you really are. Tamasic food is, as you might expect, pretty heavy and not very nourishing. It usually has a grounding effect, but also dulls the mind. This is like leftover food and microwaved or frozen foods, fast food, food made without any love, and so on. Like, you know those boxes of cereal that are basically just heavily processed flour and sugar? That's tamasic food, for sure. In the long run, tamasic food drags one's body of consciousness into a state of inertia and laziness. And so if you eat and then immediately feel like you just wanna go and crash on the couch, now you know why. Rajasic food, on the other hand, is food that promotes activity. Caffeine, garlic, strong spices, or just spicy food in general, eggs, meat, fermented foods, fried foods, some overcooked foods, and so on. These foods provide an initial burst of energy, but eventually may also bring you down into a crash, a state of lethargy, as well as having increased stress. A person with a rajasic diet will usually eat on the go, eat very quickly, and usually gain a poor digestive system as a result. Finally, there is sattvic food. This is simple food, mainly fresh and nourishing fruit and vegetables, food that is easy to digest and made with love. Sattvic meals generally are not overly complicated and they raise one's consciousness, inspire positive action, deeper meditation, and help with one becoming more creative, happy, and peaceful in all aspects of life. With all of this under your belt, now you can start to understand and identify where you and others in your life are resonating. Perhaps through your own actions and intentions, you can bring yourself and others up through sattva and help transform the tamas and rajas into a higher expression of itself. In this way, the whole world may be transformed by your love. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Oh, and before I forget, we just created our very own Aquarian Age edition of the Tao Te Ching. Keep watching if you'd like to learn more about that right now. The Tao Te Ching was first written in ancient China thousands of years ago, and even today its origins are mysterious. The word Tao actually translates closest to the way, and is a collection of 81 verses explaining how to understand the fluid-like nature of reality and how to be a strong leader for yourself and others in life. Through these poetic verses, they describe the flow of all things, how the cosmos of forms comes from the formless, and how to bring yourself into a state of harmony and balance with all things. It was said to have been written by an author named Lao Tzu, but learning more about this individual yields even more mystery. The name Lao Tzu itself is actually not a name, but a title, which means old man or old master. And today, even still, there are debates that continue as to whether or not he was an individual or a small collective of different philosophers since time immemorial in ancient China. Over the past several thousand years, humanity has studied and practiced the way of the Tao, striving to understand that which even the Tao Te Ching says is beyond all comprehension. For me, the Tao Te Ching has been a foundation of my spiritual growth and understanding for many years. And that's something that I've always wanted to share with the spirit science audience in a bigger way. However, the more editions of the Tao that I studied, the more I began to notice discrepancies. Sometimes passages would hold a completely different meaning from book to book, to the degree where they downright contradicted each other where some translations would suggest you can know the Tao, others would say you cannot know the Tao, and then some would just omit certain phrases altogether in favor of the author's interpretation 
which seemed to not have anything to do with what the original writing said. Now, a few years ago, it was suggested by a member of my team that we could create a new edition of the Tao Te Ching, perhaps one that could unify and harmonize these discrepancies once and for all. Naturally, after having just finished with Patch Tarot, this seemed like a worthwhile endeavor. Going deeper into the original meaning and discerning the truth underlying the various editions of the Tao Te Ching was very appealing to me. This is where the Aquarian Age edition of the Tao Te Ching comes from. I spent a great deal of time studying and reflecting upon a number of versions of the Tao Te Ching, often side by side, comparing them, meditating upon their meanings, and taking myself further than I ever had in understanding them. One of the most important things in this process to me was understanding the ancient original. And so I researched direct translations where they would explain the Chinese characters directly side by side, character by character into English. This led to a deepening of understanding and these old writings were then cross-referenced by a number of modern translations. It is my intention that this edition of the Tao Te Ching provides clarity and deeper understanding for everyone who reads it about the nature of reality at a fundamental level. To help with this, we're also going to be hosting the Eight Days of Tao, a live week-long event inside of Spirit Mysteries to explore the Tao Te Ching in thorough detail, reflect together and understand it better so that we may all put the teachings into actual practice. Anyone who pre-orders this book will receive a free 30-day trial to the Initiate Membership in Spirit Mysteries, which includes an invitation to the Eight Days of Tao. With all of this together, this new edition of the Tao Te Ching invites you to step into your innermost way by understanding the Tao like you never have before. Learn, grow, and become wise.